We might add to the list of great boxing enthusiasts the authors Albert Camus, A.J. Leibling, Richard Wright, D.H. Lawrence, Vladimir Nabokov, William Hazlitt, Robert Graves, William Thackeray, FX Toole and George Plimpton. Camus was an amateur boxer. Thackeray, along with Charles Dickens, witnessed the first attempt at achieving a world heavyweight title in 1860 when England's Tom Sayers took on the USA's John Heenan. Like Dickens, as well as the Prince of Wales and Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, he was amongst those who beat a hasty retreat when the police arrived to break up the illegal event. George Plimpton decided to add to his long list of examples of participatory journalism by stepping into the ring with the great Archie Moore for a three-round sparring match. Moore, a showman himself, recounted in his autobiography that, although he was wary of fighting amateurs, he was careful to give them just enough for a story. After the fight, Moore approached the now vomiting and bloody-nosed Plimpton with a hearty pat on the back and the reassurance that the journalist was entitled to a rematch. Paul Gallico, who mentioned my family's circus in his novel Love Let Me Not Hunger, was perhaps even more masochistic in his journalistic pursuits. Keen to know what it was like to be on the receiving end of a trained fighter's barrage, he was duly knocked out during his sparring match by none other than the Manasseh Mauler Jack Dempsey. Prolific journalist and playwright Joyce Carol Oates surprised many in her own circle of literary influence when she wrote On Boxing, a seminal work on this particular martial art. Novelist, journalist, voice artist, radio personality, book reviewer and poet Catherine Dunn not only wrote extensively on boxing throughout the 1990s, her collected essays and articles on the sport being published in the book One Ring Circus Dispatches from the World of Boxing, but began training in the sport in her 40s. Many other great writers have suffered more than bruised egos in their confrontations. We have only to look at Miguel de Cervantes, the man often credited with being the originator of the modern novel Don Quixote, itself a parable for martial artists with delusions of grandeur, as an example. Cervantes got into a quarrel with Antonio de Segura at the Royal Palace in Madrid. The resulting argument resulted in a sword-fighting duel, where Cervantes disarmed and wounded Segura. Fearing losing his hand for the crime of engaging in a duel on royal property, Cervantes fled Spain for Italy. He would live most of his life in poverty and obscurity, but did win military acclaim when he was wounded in action fighting for Spain against the Ottoman Empire at the Battle of Lepanto. Only a few decades later in England, Shakespeare's contemporary, the great playwright Ben Jonson, slew an actor called Spencer on an archery range in the East End of London. Spencer, who had played parts in both Jonson and Shakespeare's plays, was a known fighter who had got away with killing a man with his unsheathed sword two years previously. Jonson, who had run Spencer through after receiving an injury to the arm, had got away with only having his thumb branded with the letter T as a reminder of the Tyburn gallows for which he should have been sent to, and having to recite the 51st Psalm while pleading forgiveness. He had appealed to the right of clergy and been tried in an ecclesiastical court. Two great writers of Russia weren't so lucky when they chose pistols in their duels in the 19th century. They were the poet Mikhail Lomontov and the author Alexander Pushkin, who both died from fatal bullet wounds. My first martial arts book, Mordred's Victory, begins with an essay I wrote back in the mid-2000s called Martial Academia. Although I stand by the arguments I've made for the dangers of becoming too abstract in one's combative training without taking a visceral reality check, sometimes I wonder if I shouldn't have written an accompanying piece to explain the value of academia. Critical thinking and the scientific process, after all, are part of educated research and help separate useful martial arts knowledge from superstition and mysticism. We should keep those bridges between the intellects and the fighters open. After all, the philosophers, the scholars, the educators and politicians have helped martial arts survive when different systems so easily could have become extinct. Kano Jigaro, the founder of judo, helped make his synthesis of three traditional jiu-jitsu schools and pioneered a modern combat sport through his skills and influence as an academic educator in the Japanese school system. He paved the way in Japan for the newly imported Okinawan martial art of karate and many others with its dogies and belt ranking systems, not to mention an emphasis on improving the character of its students. Sadly, the practicing lawyer and rebel Tang Hyo, who worked tirelessly to promote Chinese martial arts away from impracticality and to debunk its many myths in favour of solid historical research, is little remembered today. Sun Lu Tang was far more influential. In fact, he remains the most influential Chinese martial arts author of all time. 
Sun Lu Tang was a rare combination of feared fighter and respected scholar who melded his knowledge of Taoist philosophy with the teaching of the three internal systems of Taiji, Baguai and Zingi. The martial arts historians Brian Kennedy and Elizabeth Gyo have explained that he is a reason why we have such systems being practiced for health reasons rather than combat. He also helped create the iconic figure of the peaceful, wise, sage martial arts teacher trope to replace the previous brutal images of bandits and militia fighters that had made up his predecessors. For good or ill, by using philosophy and by articulating his training methods in a way that wouldn't threaten the fragile governments or occupying forces, helped propagate the continued practice of many martial arts. By contrast, we have seen the death of many martial arts forms, both as systems for warfare and sport, because of their lack of scholastic patronage. Interestingly, the most well-known work of Musashi Miyamoto, perhaps the most famous historical samurai warrior in at least the Edo period, was the Book of Five Rings. The book is a straight-up manual of his school of Kenjutsu as told from the perspective of a medieval samurai. However, due to Masashi's strong interest and dedication to philosophy in his retirement years, the work is now far more revered and cited as a forced allegory on business strategy than a book on killing fellow duelists in 17th century Japan. Aristocles, from 4th and 3rd centuries BCE, would go on to become one of the most influential thinkers in Western philosophy. However, he would do so not under the name he inherited from his grandfather, but as Plato, which he received from his wrestling coach. The name comes from the Greek word Platon, meaning broad, and might be in reference to Plato's large shoulders and chest. Plato would become a very proficient wrestler who trained into adulthood and to a high level to be able to compete in the Ismian Games. With his most famous work, The Republic, he argued for the goal of great people to be in tune mentally and physically. He saw combat sports as a mean of body cultivation comparable to the way the mind was exercised. Such idealism is not far removed from what we have seen weaving its way through the history of martial arts practice and teaching. We may even consider the art aspect of martial arts being, despite what Meryl Streep and other intelligentsia have stated to the contrary, to be an actual art. After all, many martial artists have Hemingway and Plato-like relationships between their combative discipline and more famed forms of expression. Take, if you must, the 330-minute operatic experimental film River of Fundament. Matthew Barney's epic piece barely conforms to the conventions of even art house cinema. It is more a series of performances recorded over a seven-year period strung together using a loose narrative. The film is not an easy watch unless you are heavily into that particular art scene. I took this abstract bullet for the team. It has no obvious connection to martial arts except when you consider three points. Firstly, the core influence of the work is American novelist and sports writer Norman Mailer. In fact, the entire piece is inspired by his 1983 novel Ancient Evenings and deals with three reincarnations of the author. Mailer is the most obvious spiritual successor to Ernest Hemingway and true to form he wrestled with the comparisons made between him and his inspiration. Like the figure he praised and cursed he shared an obsession with boxing. This could be seen by his obsession with Muhammad Ali and the half a year he spent writing The Fight, a non-fiction account of Ali's world championship fight with George Foreman in Zaire. Mailer would only be too happy to be one of the interviewees in the 1996 documentary about the bout When We Were Kings. Like Hemingway, Mailer had his own boxing ring and enjoyed sparring with everyone. He even sparred former champion and friend Jose Torres for three televised rounds as part of Torres's book promotion. Mailer also shared Hemingway's huge fragile ego, heavy drinking and a need to assert his masculinity through violence. This led to at least 20 skirmishes on the street and even on television. The same Dick Cavett show infamously saw Mailer headbutt writer and public intellectual Gore Vidal in the green room. Mailer's final brawl occurred when he was 74 and punched the publisher of Esquire. Secondly, Hemingway has a presence in River of Fundament. His spirit is invoked and towards the end we see a dramatisation of his suicide. Finally, there's a brutal performance of Submission Grappling featuring Pablo Silva and Magno Gama, which might have been a nod to Mailer's own dirty brawling tactics. He bit actor Rip Torn's ear during their work on an experimental film and received two eye gouges when he had a fight one night in an argument over the sexual orientation of his poodles. I kid you not. This fight scene in River of Fundament, set in a car factory, is perhaps one of the most expressive examples of Brazilian jiu-jitsu put on film, although not quite worth watching the entire movie for that particular scene. Having Brazilian jiu-jitsu make its way into the Californian art scene is fairly predictable. 
Orion Gracie's his decision to break into Hollywood in 1978 pretty much did for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu what Bruce Lee did for Kung Fu and Wing Chun in particular when he moved to California in the 60s. To this day, Wing Chun retains a few dedicated students in Hollywood. Robert Downey Jr. and Nicolas Cage are prime examples of long-term students whose interest in the art wasn't just motivated by fight scenes in their movies. By the 1980s, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu became the open secret amongst tough guy celebrities who were intrigued by the Gracie Challenge and no doubt were introduced to footage of the Valley Tudo matches that have been televised in Brazil. With the art first being revealed to audiences in 1987's Lethal Weapon, the film star Mel Gibson was an obvious early convert. The Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu celebrity list is now quite extensive, including many obvious action stars as well as the director Guy Ritchie. However, one of its most dedicated students and one of the few who earned a black belt relatively early compared to his contemporaries is Ed O'Neill. O'Neill is an actor famous for his comedy roles, especially those in the situation comedies Married with Children and Modern Family. When one considers the amount of time and hours on the mat needed to typically get a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, few busy celebrities can make it past blue and purple stages. If they make it to these grades, it's a huge achievement. O'Neill got his black belt through Horry and Gracie after 22 years of training and declared that it was, quote-unquote, the greatest achievement of my life apart from my children. <laughs> 